I'm Nicole Testa Boston. I'm the deputy director here at the Viatech Consortium at, based at the University of Texas in Austin. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today for our webinar where we're going to be hearing from Boris Flager on structural design optimization. Um, he won an award, one of our study awards that was um, given to him at our April April uh, conference back in Scottsdale, Arizona this past April. Um, but before we get started and learn a little bit more about his research and work, I just wanted to give a, a quick introduction to those of you who may be using GoToMeeting for the first time or GoToWebinar. Uh, you will have a toolbar on your, on your screen. You can move that around. It is unique to you. Uh, you can click that orange arrow at the top and minimize it off your screen uh, if you want an unobstructed view of the, of the presentation. Um, and you will have also noticed that you're on a default mute setting. So um, because of the number of people attending, um, you're not able to speak. But we do encourage questions and comments and points of clarification. And, and you can do so by typing those in under the questions tab. Uh, those will come directly to me. And as time permits, at the end of the webinar, I will moderate a, a discussion with Forrest um, about those points. And if we do run out of time, we'll follow up with you personally. Uh, following the webinar. Um, what else? We are also recording this presentation, uh, both the audio and the visual, and we will be posting it on our website at fiatech.org. Uh, give us a couple of days to get that up on the site, but you will be able to download it and share it with others. So with that, I want to go ahead and inter introduce uh, Dr. Forrest Flieger. He is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Integrated Facility Engineering at Stanford, which most of us know as SIFI. Uh, his research focuses on computational tools to support design exploration, particularly those that make the process more collaborative and interactive. Uh, before beginning his uh, PhD, uh, Forrest worked as a structural engineer for AIRUP in San Francisco and London, uh, and uh, really been hanging out in some of the best towns in the, in the world. <laughs> uh, and he completed his graduate education at MIT and Stanford. So um, Boris, thank you very much for, for joining us today to share this with us. And I'll turn it over to you. Yes, thanks a lot, Nicole. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so just a quick overview of um, our talk today. So I was just going to give a little introduction to um, the types of problems uh, that we're going to address, mainly structural design problems. Uh, talk about some kind of metrics gathered from current practice, uh, then discuss uh, sort of the optimization method um, that was part of my doctoral dissertation and then has been applied on a few industry projects subsequently, um, and then talk about kind of future directions for the technology. So by way of introduction, um, as Nicole mentioned, uh, worked for a few years um, overseas um, primarily as a structural engineer working on kind of large uh, steel structures, um, mostly sports related. Um, so with the Arab Sport Group uh, that works out of London office. Um, so there's just some of the example projects and we're going to focus in on, on one here uh, just to kind of describe the problem generically. Uh, so uh, basically we have a large uh, space frame uh, roof structure for a stadium. Uh, and in terms of the objective of the design process as the structural engineer, one of the things you're trying to achieve is economy. Um, and a lot of times, uh, the engineer won't have sort of detailed pricing information. So um, they'll be given some understanding of cost based on a tonnage of steel. So really the goal there is to, to minimize the amount of material in the structure uh, with some understanding of constructability constraints. And we'll kind of circle back to that as some of the extensions to this work. Um, as well, uh, this roof structure is exposed, um, so you have some architectural requirements to uh, make a pleasing visual uh, appearance in terms of you know, keeping some of the section diameters, so you have clean lines and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then in terms of uh, some of the constraints, of course, uh, safety and serviceability are paramount, so you're trying to satisfy all the strength requirements uh, so that structure doesn't collapse under uh, any extreme loading conditions, as well as serviceability. Um, some of that is just um, the perception of movement in the roof under high winds. Um, so you kind of have de deflection and acceleration requirements. Um, 
And then if you look in terms of the variables that the engineer um, can adjust uh, to kind of configure the design, in this case, we're just talking about member sizing, which is uh, basically um, choosing the cross-sectional areas for all of the steel members in the roof. Um, and I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but um, basically on the kind of bottom right uh, illustration, um, you'll have some kind of example sections. Some are tubes, some are square sections, and then you have eye sections as well. Um, so in this case, this structure had roughly 2,000 members, and with the architectural requirements, um, there were about 20 different sort of commonly fabricated uh, sections that um, the engineer could choose from that met the sort of architectural and fabrication constraints. Um, so then if you just basically look at it as a math problem and you enumerate out all the possible configurations, you get that large number uh, that you see there at the bottom. Um, so just to kind of, you know, from perspective, we're dealing with kind of very large problems in terms of the space of possible designs. So the question is, how do engineers come up with uh, the most efficient designs given such a sort of large problem space? So we're going to look at some metrics from current practice. And I just, uh, this may be familiar to uh, those in the industry, but I just want to give a brief overview of the sort of design process at a high level. So. Uh, generally, you start uh, with what I'm calling a geometric model. This is basically some representation of uh, the, the project geometry and shape. Um, oftentimes, in you know modern projects, that's uh, done using 3D software, BIM software, to kind of create the, the geometric representation. Uh, then the engineer will typically take that geometric representation and idealize it into some sort of analytical model. So you see here. Uh, we've got a stick model that's got uh, the member center lines as well as all the loading and connection fixity applied. So this is a finite element model in this case um, that can be used to assess uh, sort of forces and deflections of the structure. Um, then we have this third step, which I'm calling constraint check, which is basically checking uh, whether the forces and deflections applied on the structure are within the strength and serviceability limits that I described previously. Um, and the result of that is what I'm calling the utilization, um, which is basically some ratio of uh, the observed strength and deflection against the allowable. So is this structure, is the current convic configuration meeting the requirements or constraints or not? And based on uh, those results, the engineer has a couple of options that they can do to try to improve the design. One is what I'm calling optimizing sizing, and that's changing the cross-sectional areas of the structure. Another option that they have is shape, and that's basically changing sort of the center line geometry of the members in the frame, so actually changing the, the shape or geometry of the structure. Um, so uh, with that in mind, that conventional process in mind, the, the questions that we had were in terms of efficiency, um, how long is it taking engineers to kind of look at a design option, uh, what I'm calling cycle duration, and then how many options do they look at on a typical project, um, and then in terms of effectiveness, you know, what is the quality of, of solutions that they're generating at the end of that process. So um, a survey of uh, sort of leading uh, design firms to try and understand what is a rough understanding, a uh, rough idea of, of how long this process takes. Um, and so if you read this um, table here, we've got for a sizing iteration, so that's changing the cross-sectional areas, it's taking about four hours of man hours. Um, so that involves um, you know, adjusting it, running the analysis, uh, uh, partially in the results. Um, and then we've got a longer duration for shape, um, Part of that longer duration can be attributed to some level of coordination with the rest of the design team. Um, as you change the shape of the structure, you're commonly having to interface with other disciplines, mechanical engineers, architects, to make sure that that uh, works with their sort of subsystems as well. Um, and then you see cycle time, about 36 different sizing iterations on a typical project and eight different shape iterations. And so just sort of summing that up, they're looking at about 44 total options about 250 man hours uh, on an average job. Um, and then we dug a little bit deeper to understand where that time was spent. Um, and this, um, this was a little bit of a surprise, at least to me, a, a couple of years ago when this research was done. 
Um, you see um, there's a relatively small amount of time spent sort of planning the workflow for the process. Um, executing is actually, you know, generating uh, design options, um, sort of uh, looking at the results to make design decisions. And then we've got this chunk, which is actually the majority, which is what I'm calling managing information. Uh, this is basically taking information that exists in one format, for example, your BIM model, and translating it into another representation that's, say, convenient for analysis. So um, constructing your analytical representation from a BIM model, um, it's post-processing the results so that you can make sense out of them. And surprisingly, um, you know, that's where engineers are spending the most of their time. And so that's was the first sign that there was sort of opportunity for innovation here and that, you know, that's not really what I would think of as the most, uh, the best use of the engineer's time. They're not really using their uh, training and expertise. They're really spending a lot of time um, dealing with the data and managing that information to, to make the design process work. Um, so then if we look in terms of design exploration, um, it seems like a reasonable number. They're looking at 40 different you know, sizing alternatives in the case of um, the stadium roof structure. But then if you compare that to you know, the, the number of possible configurations that we looked at previously, the real question is, you know, is this sufficient? Um, do engineers have enough experience and skill in this domain that you know, they can find the best designs in a very small number of alternatives that they evaluate compared to the total possible. Um, so just to kind of sum, sum up uh, observations from industry, you know, um, I would call relatively inefficient processes with all the time spent managing information and then looking at a very small subset of the design space and, you know, the real question is, does that lead to, you know, suboptimal design solutions? Is there room for improvement there? Um, so with that, um, I started looking in other industries um, and found this field of computational design optimization, which is really about taking the process that I just described and formalizing it um, so that you can use uh, computer processing to automate data flow and to iterate through different options uh, to try and find better designs. Um, and this sort of uh, CDO practice um, is commonly used in aerospace, automotive, electronics, for example, semiconductors, to really bring design cycle time down, look at a broader area of the space, and, and improve product quality. So the question is, you know, can these techniques uh, be applied to AC given sort of some of the unique features of, of this industry? Um, so now I'm going to kind of explain a little bit about the optimization method um, and then discuss some applications. So first, just a brief description of uh, the methods called BIOPS, um, and it includes uh, two different algorithms, um, and this is the first one. Um, so this is the same process flow that we stepped through before, um, and what we have here is uh, member sizing. Um, and so in terms of the related research, there's actually been you know, a lot of uh, work, academic research done on this subject. Um, there's kind of two classes of methods, and I'm going to cover this very briefly, and then if there's time and interest at the end, we can you know, discuss the details of the algorithms more. But basically, you have deterministic techniques, um, which assume the problem is continuous, right? So even though fabricators are making sort of discrete section types, right, you have an I section of a certain depth and a certain weight, and then the next section um, it's not a continual variance, right? You have certain weights and certain sizes of sections that are commonly produced, um, and the optimizer needs to choose from those discrete sets. Um, so the problem is, is th those methods approximate the problem is continuous, um, and then they try to map it back to sort of the nearest discrete section size. Um, and there's some error uh, and uh, as associated with that. Either you, you're not finding the, the uh, optimal design or you're not finding the uh, a design that satisfies all the constraints. Um, and then you have heuristic methods such as genetic algorithms and heuristic particle swarm and other methods like that. Those methods actually uh, can deal with discrete problems very well. Um, there's no limitations on continuity. They're very flexible to different problems. 
but they take quite a lot of computational resources. Um, so they're great on kind of small structural problems, but when you start applying them to problems of the size of the, of the stadium roof structure I showed, um, even with sort of a cluster of machines, um, you're not able to sort of find uh, optimal solutions. Um, so this, uh, this FCD algorithm combines uh, features of both in that it's relatively computationally efficient with no limitations on continuity and it's flexible. Um, so that's sort of the contribution of this method. And then there's another algorithm um, that's applied that deals with the shape variables. So those are actually continuous. We've got, you know, for example, the depth of a truss between, you know, four and eight meters. So you've got some continuous range. Um, this method works off of surrogate models, so it basically runs a bunch of analyses in parallel, and then it creates an approximation of the of the whole design space from that sampling, and then it uses some gradient optimizers, which work really quickly to find the most promising areas of the space, and then it sort of refines the surrogate models that it's made iteratively until it um, converges on the best solution. So the advantages of this is it's really computationally efficient because all the optimization is done off of the surrogate models, which are easy to evaluate. You don't have to run finite element analysis or any long-running simulations. It's relatively robust, and it's a global search in that um, it searches uh, multiple areas where there may be minimum weight designs. Um, so um, in terms of implementation, um, we've got a process here set up. Uh, we're managing the geometry um, in digital project, which is basically a, uh, a parametric CAD tool. Um, it uh, basically uses the CATIA engine, which is a common aerospace CAD package. Um, you could quite easily substitute a different CAD tool um, that is more common to the building industry. Um, for example, you could do this with Revit or Rhino or, or other COD, Kamen. Uh, common CAD packages. We've got our finite element structural analysis tool. In this case, we used uh, GSA, um, which is a package developed by Oasis. And then we've got some custom scripts that were written to check against the building code requirements. And then we've got the two optimization algorithms at the bottom there. Um, so again, you know, this is just a real brief introduction to the technology and the algorithms and um, you know, if you're really interested, there are some papers that kind of describe these methods in more detail. But I just wanted to give you some general background. And now I kind of want to show some applications of, of this method. So uh, the first example is the one that I used um, in the introduction. Um, we've got the stadium roof structure. And then we looked at sort of the metrics that we described before. So. Um, if we start with the efficiency, we've got setup time, uh, conventional practice. This is sort of building all the different uh, BIM and, and simulation models. Um, so we see sort of 80 hours additional setup time um, for the FCD method. And that the time there was spent primarily um, writing a wrapper for the application so that we could automate the exchange of information, uh, as well as writing the optimization methods. Um, so in a way, this is a, this additional setup time is a little misleading in that it's a one-time cost. Um, for example, if we wanted to uh, repeat this process, and I'll show some additional examples of that, we've already got the wrapper written. We just need to plug in a new model um, so that setup time essentially vanishes um, the additional setup time after uh, you have the after you set up the process. Um, and then that second row um, is where the real advantage comes in. Um, you can reduce the design cycle time from four hours, which is the manual method, to in this case three seconds. Um, and so the, the sort of order of magnitude improvement in design cycle time um, comes from automation, but also from the fact that um, we can parallelize the uh, finite element analysis over a network of machines. You see there beneath the FCD method, we're using 128 processors in a computer network um, to run the optimization so that we can get almost sort of real-time uh, results. Um, so instead of looking at, you know, around 40 options, we're looking in, you know, in the tens of thousands. Um, and we complete the entire process sort of in less time uh, than, uh, than the conventional process. Um, so process-wise, it sort of works within industry 
you know, time frames, um, and then uh, in terms of product quality, in this case, we're able to reduce the weight uh, by roughly 20%, and um, the same design was used for, the, there's two roof structures, if you remember from the picture, they're both symmetrical, um, so the total uh, cost savings um, is around two million. So on you know large steel structures, you can achieve some significant savings um, by implementing these methods, at least from this example. Um, and then just to show um, a little bit about you know what makes the structure more efficient in terms of how it's performing. Um, so the two images, well, the images you have uh, are a map of the amount of steel in the structure. Um, so you, if you look at um, the baseline design and where the steel is, the sort of structural concept that the engineers had um, was to make a very um, stiff leading edge for the structure. You see a lot of steel is on the bottom cord on the leading edge of the structure, so this would act like a rib, um, a stiff rib, and then the structure would span back to where it's continuously supported on the rear edge of the structure. Um, so if you look at the uh, optimized design configuration, you see there's very relatively little steel in the leading edge, and more of the steel is pushed back a few bays into the truss. Um, the reason why that it makes it more efficient is because there's actually a little bit more structural depth there. So there's a little bit more, uh, it's more efficient bending resistance, and you have a greater depth between the top surface and the bottom surface. Um, as well, because you make the structure stiff, um, if you see on the baseline design, there's a lot of steel on the supports um, where it's fixed into concrete um, on each side. And that was basically because the structure was deflecting a lot at, at the sort of mid-span of the arch. And then it was creating large bending moments uh, at the supports where it's fixed into concrete. And so they need a lot of steel to resist that. Um, whereas by stiffening those arches, you need there's less bending moment, sort of less of a hinge created at the supports. So you get less steel, less bending, um, and that improves the efficiency. So I just want to give some idea of, you know, after the optimization completes, the engineer, you know, can review the results and try to understand, you know, why the structure is behaving more differently and, in this case, more efficiently. So this is um, a second example. Um, so in this example, we wanted to extend beyond just changing member sizes to also change some of the geometry of the roof. Um, so again, it's another stadium roof structure. Um, you can see that this roof um, has two really large trusses which span about um, 180 meters. They support the moving portion of the roof as well as the fixed portion. Um, and that's the sort of scope of our optimization is to look at those large trusses and to try to optimize the sizing as well as the shape. So I have a video here. Um, this isn't actually showing the optimization process working. It's just a parametric scan that's going to show you how the distribution of steel changes in the structure as the depth increases. Um, and so for each sort of frame in this movie, um, there was a sizing optimization run, right? So it's looking at the optimal configuration of member sizes, cross sections, for that geometry. So you can kind of see how the distribution changes from sort of behaving like an arch where you've got a lot of um, steel on the sort of bottom cord and, and uh, as it gets deeper, it behaves more like a beam. You've got um, more area in the sort of lacing the diagonals between the top and bottom cord. Um, so, you know, the reason why I show this is because, you know, given sort of the cloud computing technology that's coming on, it might be possible to have in the future more interactive systems in which designers or engineers can interact with this geometry and receive real-time feedback on, you know, the steel um, distribution of steel in the structure. So it's basically a toy that you could play with to start adjusting the form of the structure and you'll be getting sort of real-time performance feedback on how that affects efficiency. So this is the results of that study. Um, you've got um, on this chart to the left, um, in the blue, the blue dots show weight um, as the depth of the 
truss at mid-span changes. So you see from this chart that the optimum depth in, term of, in terms of minimum weight is achieved at about 8 meters depth of the roof truss. And the displacement in this case um, is achieved uh, at the same, well, you can see the displacement goes down as the depth of the roof increases, as you might expect. Um, what's interesting here is that um, the entire range of roof depths um, satisfy the displacement constraint. Um, so um, I forgot to mention in this previous study, you see that there's some cables here on the rear edge of the supports. Um, so initially, the engineers were actually having trouble controlling, meeting the def deflection constraint at mid-span. So they're actually applying pre-stress. They're pulling on the edges of this truss to sort of uh, reduce the amount that it was moving or deflecting in the mid-span. Um, what the results of this optimization show is um, that you know they probably use too much pre-stress. They might not even need to use pre-stress at all, given the optimized design. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, in this case, you know, we reduce the weight uh, by, you know, basically a third. Um, and you know, these long span structures, you know, the self weight is significant portion of the sort of total weight that the structures have to support. And so you kind of get a knock on benefit as you make the structure more efficient. It needs to support less weight, and so you um, can really achieve some higher efficiency. So in this case, you know, because we're able to make the structure more efficient. Um, we probably could have had some additional savings by reducing, you know, the pre-stress um, and the cables, which is expensive because you have to have foundations basically to hold, hold those pre-stress cables, um, keep them from pulling up in the ground, and that's an additional cost to the structure that's not captured in this 34% savings. The final example I want to show um, is uh, a more of a conventional building. So an obvious question is, it works great on you know large sort of complex geometry roofs, but is there some value to applying this on a more of a regular building? Um, so this is a, an educational building in the UK. Um, it's got a gymnasium um, on part of the structure. Um, and then it has classrooms and studios on the other part. Um, and so there are vibration requirements. You don't want, as there's activities happening in the main span, um, you don't want that disturbing events that are happening in the classroom um, and in the studios. So, excuse me, just wanted to make sure I kind of lost the go-to tag. Um, so, um, because of the vibration requirements, um, it made the problem more complex because the stiffness of the beam were reflecting, you know, how the vibration propagated through the structure, and that vibration was actually governing the design of most of the beams in the structure. Um, so, by um, considering that in the optimization formulation and looking at different combination of stiffnesses to try to meet the vibration constraint with minimum weight, we were able to achieve sort of similar reductions to the stadium roofs. In this case, um, a 20% reduction in the total steel weight. Um, in this case, you know, the costs aren't quite the same because it's a much smaller project, but it did show, you know, a, a good percentage of savings on a more sort of standard geometry steel frame building. Um, so that's um, that sort of concludes the case study demonstrations. Um, so I just want to um, sort of wrap up with um, some summary and extensions of this technology. Um, so in general, I think you know trying to demonstrate some potential for savings by applying these types of methods. Um, in terms of the project types that this sort of technology is suited for. Um, we've got steel frame structures, generally larger, um, more complex projects. Um, if you've got a very regular structure um, in which all the bays are the same and, and um, you only need to design you know, a few members in the structure and that's representative, um, you know, manual methods, because the problem size, size is much smaller, uh, tend to work pretty well. But when you get into sort of larger, more complex projects, it just becomes difficult to manually look at all the different alternatives you might like to. Um, in this case, variables we can handle shape and member 
member sizing, section sizing. Um, there's an additional variable which we haven't discussed, which is uh, called topology. And that's basically looking at things like the number of members in the structure and how they're laid out. Um, so you could look at, for example, on a tall building, different bracing patterns or configurations. Um, that's something that we're currently researching but haven't yet uh, reduced to practice. Um, and then in terms of constraints, um, we've shown, you know, ability to consider strength, deflection, dynamics, um, as well as architectural and fabrication constraints. Um, additional work, we could probably add in, you know, seismic constraints or some more performance, you know, risk and reliability based constraints. Um, so just looking for sort of the right applications where that's a, a constraint that the designers are dealing with. Um, and then the last thing is in terms of technology extensions, and I have some slides that will talk about each of these. Uh, the first is cost-based optimization and then looking at uh, considering multiple disciplines in the optimization process. So with regard to cost, um, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, we're really only considering uh, the raw material cost, some estimate. Um, and you know we're trying to minimize the weight um, with the sort of assumption that that's going to minimize the cost. Of course, you know people that are involved uh, in depth contractors and fabricators know that you know weight isn't the only driver of cost. In fact, you know raw materials are typically only a third of the total uh, cost of the steel structure in place. We've got erection, fabrication concern. Uh, concerns and then miscellaneous things like different finishing and transportation requirements. And so um, the research interest here is can we consider um, all of these different cost components in the optimization process? Um, and so you know we're, we're currently researching uh, working with a fabricator who has a much better understanding of both the cost of raw materials but also some of the fabrication costs and including that in our cost model. So that's, um, instead of just looking at weight, we're also considering all the different components that drive cost and optimizing on that basis. Um, so the objective there is to show that the minimum weight design might not be the minimum cost design and that there is the capability to consider all these other cost factors in the optimization process. And uh, again, on a, on a more broad level, um, looking at extending this beyond just the structural domain uh, to look at um, all the other costs that a building owner uh, or operator might incur. So that would be, if you look at the process here, we've got our BIM model. We're also looking at um, incorporating an energy simulation. Um, so you can imagine some of the applications for that in terms of looking at different mechanical systems, different types of insulation and window types and things uh, to try and bring down operational costs. And then in terms of kind of capital costs, um, looking at um, all sorts of different variables in terms of you know, different types of facade materials and, and things like that. Um, and so trying to provide some insight, in this case, the, the project that we're working on is in the conceptual level when you're a building owner and you're trying to basically come up with a massing from your building, how many floors should I have? I need this much program area. Um, how can I lay out these buildings on the site? We can provide, you know, very early on in the design process, some understanding of what the economic impacts are, as well as environmental impacts. So if you see there on the right side, um, we're trading off, you know, the first cost of the structure against um, the carbon footprint. Um, so the carbon footprint is considering not only the energy embodied in the materials, but also uh, the carbon generated as a result of the operation of the building in terms of heating and cooling. And so you see different opportunities and trade-offs there in terms of um, what is the cheapest structure is not uh, the most environmentally friendly or the cheapest to operate. Um, and then there's some trade-off into you know, very expensive capital systems, which are marginally uh, less expensive to operate and create less of a carbon footprint. So the idea here is basically to provide designers or stakeholders with sort of trade-off plots where they can look at a bunch of different options and understand sort of 
the trade-off between different design decisions and hopefully you know make the decision that best uh, best meets their goals with you know a good understanding of uh, what the risks are and, and what the opportunity cost is. So that's um, that concludes uh, the presentation. Here's just looking at some different configurations for a very simple test case building. Um, and uh, I'd like now to um, open it up uh, for questions and discussion. So thanks very much for uh, listening and uh, interested to hear if you have any comments or questions about what I've talked about. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Forrest. Uh, we do have a couple questions, and if anyone else has some, please just um, type those in using the questions tab on your toolbar. Um, this question came in earlier. Uh, the process evaluates a bunch of options, uh, but the results may not be constructible in real life. How do you provide things like cost, constructability, et cetera, as an input, because lowest weight may not necessarily translate into cheaper? Yes. Um, so I, hopefully um, that became a little clearer looking at you know some of the extensions to this research. But that's true. Um, but just to address that, um, in terms of this, the first case study example, and I'll skip back to that. Um, here. So in this case, um, there were. They, they had a you know system of connections that they wanted to use and so the choices that the optimizer could choose from um, were limited um, in this case mostly to changing the say the thicknesses of different tubes the thicknesses of different circular hollow sections or eye sections within basically a, a very small range in terms of the overall depth so that the connection system wouldn't have to change um, you'd just be adjusting you know basically the thicknesses of plates um, in the structure, and so that meant, you know, that meant in terms of the architecture that, you know, if you've got a bunch of tubes along running along the bottom uh, cord of your space frame that are exposed, you've got like a consistent diameter along the entire bay, so that visually it's consistent, and you know, the same sort of connection strategy can be employed. Um, so, admittedly, um, that's not the ideal way um, because ideally you'd like to look at you know, different sizes of sections and understand how that impacted connection costs um, and other other things like that, um, or even, you know, the, the varying costs between different types of sections. Um, so that's more of the cost-based optimization, and that's, you know, a next step of the research is to incorporate in a, a more detailed cost model. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Yes, um, we have a couple more. One is about getting a copy of the presentation. Um, yes, we are recording this, and we will post a copy on the fiatech.org website uh, later this week. Uh, another question, does the current optimization include consideration for connections? On a simple basis, at least that a supporting member is bigger or equal to the supported member, or on a more complex basis, optimizing wall web thickness to reduce stiffeners. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, basically, the you know the connections in this case were dealt with at a very superficial level by trying to restrict a restricted design space. Um, but it doesn't directly, um, it doesn't automate connection design, or it doesn't incorporate like a you know unit cost per connection or anything sophist more sophisticated like that. So right now, the only way that the method handles connection costs is by sort of restricting the choices to an area where you know, um, hopefully you can use the same connections, you know, kind, type of connection, or you're confident that um, the connection cost is, you know, relatively consistent. Um, so that's, that's future research as well as incorporating in that sort of uh, a better costing model for connections. Okay. Great. Well, those were our questions. Um, we don't have any others, but if... Uh, if, if anyone does have any questions, you can email me at ntboston at fiatech.org. Um, quick question, how do you estimate the cost savings? Just dollars per T? Yes, dollars per ton. Okay. Uh, and um, anyway, thank you very much for us. I appreciate it. We will be, like I said, uh, putting a copy of this recording up on the website. 
And I um, appreciate all of you attending and, and Forrest for your time in presenting to our group. We're going to be taking a few weeks off. We've got the FIA Tech member meeting coming up the first week of October. Uh, the second week of October, I'm going to be in Australia attending the Paul Caesar Association meeting. So our, our next um, our next webinar will be October 18th, and our schedule is up on the FIA Tech website. So I encourage all of you to participate in that. And um, members, if you haven't, register for our meeting October 3rd, 4th, and 5th in Boulder. Um, there's still a few days left to do that. So thanks again. Have a great day. And uh, thanks again, Forrest. Thank you. Bye-bye.